Well, welcome to the huddle. Joining me to analyse the second test in Adelaide, I'm joined by Bryce McGain and George DeBell. Two tests in and 2-0 Australia. Another crushing victory for the home side. This time the margin a paltry 218 runs with Ryan Harris wrapping up victory with a wicket of Monty Panesar. Only the second time in England's history they've lost two tests on the bounce by over 200 runs. Now on the verge, of course, of returning the urn. Bryce, you've obviously are in a duly good mood after this result and Everton also getting a late draw at the Emirates. But as far as the cricket's concerned, how much of this result do you put down to a simple question of hunger on the part of the Australians? Well, they've certainly uh, displayed some real passion and enjoyment for what they do. That They're certainly playing some ag an aggressive brand of cricket. I think what the, the difference between the two sides most definitely has been Australia's ability to take wickets in bunches. Um, Mitchell Johnson, obviously, with his sheer pace and aggression and dirty big moustache as well, is certainly um, intimidating everybody, uh, including all the kids watching. And uh, Look, I think um, what he's been able to do is get wickets very quickly, back-to-back -back wickets. He's been on a hat-trick and, you know, he's not knocking players over straight. That's a real key to it where that's happened less with the Australian innings. I've been able to build partnerships and maybe get through those stages. But certainly in this test and, um, and the first test as well, it's been Mitchell Johnson's, uh, well, it's his return to um, probably, he hasn't been at this form. This is, uh, this is all new for him and it's, uh, from an Australian perspective, um, very good to see. Get back to Mitchell Johnson in just a second, George. But as far as England are concerned, um, you've written much about the, the golden age of English cricket, and it does appear to be seriously on the wane now. Uh, Bryce has talked about the hunger and the passion that this Australian team have been playing with. Uh, and just by body language, the English team appears not to have the same appetite at the moment. I don't know that it's appetite, you know, JHB. I don't know about that. I, th I think they're tired. I think they're really, really exhausted. And I, and I find that people get a bit annoyed when I say that because they think they're very talented professionals. They should be managing. They should, you know, they're very well paid. And they, 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 they compare it to their own lives. And they think they, they, they're not working in a factory or something. These are the conditions I have to work under. And... Um, so I think there's not a lot of sympathy for that argument, but I tell you this, Anderson and Swan have bowled more balls than anyone in the world in international cricket, test cricket, since the series in 2010-11. And I just think they maybe can't do what they once did. We're only talking 1 or 2% here and there, but uh, an awful lot of people in that side have had a lot asked of them. No one plays as much as England. Look at the records. They just don't. And I think... Um, the same weariness that forced Jonathan Trott home, and that's what it is, you know, what everyone else says, it's not depression or anything like that, the guy is exhausted. Uh, I think that is, uh, has spread to the rest of the squad up to a point, maybe not in quite as serious a way. So I don't think it's that they don't want it, I just think that Australia are fresher and it's newer to them, and of course they are massively motivated. I just think England have been to the well too often, really. Well, they were at the well, obviously, in, in the summer, and, and they managed to pull through on that occasion. And Bryce, Alistair Cook... Only just, though, really, yeah? Yeah. Only oh, just. Absolutely. And, it, and they were flattered by the final scoreline as well. And, and I think that's something that was possibly overlooked by people. But, uh, Bryce, I just wanted to talk about Alistair Cook here. He's talked of a 2-0 margin in a football match often being a, a crucial point in a game because should the side who's trailing... 2-0 score the next goal then they have well they have all the Jared's favorite word momentum and, and there's something about Cook's manner when he speaks to the press for me at the moment when he's speaking to the media that's unconvincing and it just sounds to me as though he's he's trotting out the lines that that he needs to in order to sound as though he's still motivated but th there almost isn't the belief there and as a consequence I just wanted I mean as far as Australians are concerned, as far as the Australian team's concerned, do they feel that they've got England at the moment by the scruff of the neck, they've pinned them to the ground, and they've just got to finish them off? Well, uh, I, I really do think there is a sense of that. The Australia are playing, every player is playing with enormous confidence. Uh, the whole bowling group, they, they talk of bowling in, in a group. Um, you know, we, we touched on Mitchell Johnson before, bowling in shorter spells. That they're, they're, and I think it's just made very, very clear. And I think this is a good influence of Darren Lehman throughout the whole group. They've made it really clear with um, Mitchell Johnson. Look, just do what you do well. 
don't worry about trying to invent the things and improve the things you don't do well, like swinging the ball back in and doing all that. Just bowl really fast because it's quite intimidating. Domestic cricketers have known it for ages, and when he did get dropped out of the Australian team, um, he had to play somewhere, and it was all shaking up all the domestic batsmen, and the feedback was, he's just bowling rapid, and it's it's scaring the life out of everyone. It, it, add to that um, Harris. Harris hasn't nearly bowled the same workload as what he did in England. Um, he looks like he's going to be able to get through the series. Uh, England just haven't been able to bat for enough overs to really hurt the Australian bowlers. And Peter Siddle, he's just charging in like he always does. Nathan Lyons probably out-bowled Graham Swan and um, it was interesting, George, talking, you know, the fatigue factor and Swanee coming back from a shoulder um, uh, reconstruction or uh, re well, surgery and, and getting some repairs done there. Look, he's probably still not bowling as well as what he has done. He did take some wickets in between and leading up, but I think the fatigue factor is a factor with him and, and Anderson. The conditions are just different again. and. I think they're just being outplayed man for man right across the board at the moment, and it, it, it's a fair, I think it's a confidence level. Australia are chock full of confidence, and they're playing accordingly, and they're bullying a little bit, I suppose, as well. Where England are, are trying to fight back and counter punch. We talk about confidence there, George, and you go back to the first day of this Test match, and England dropped three catches. Now you wonderfully misquoted Oscar Wilde that dropping one catch might be considered unfortunate, but to drop three. Um, was what if you know it's worse than three, Dave? Let's let's just go into that a little bit. There were a couple of runouts. There was a wicket off a no ball. There was there were there were there were all sorts of sloppy things. I made it seven chances, I think, in the first innings eventually. Um, one way or another. It was really poor. It was the worst England uh, fielding performance I've seen for a long, long time. In fact, this game was the worst England performance I've covered in this role. Uh, in the, I've seen them bat very poorly before in the UAE, but I've never seen them bat and field very poorly, and I thought the bowling eventually began to fall apart as well. I don't blame the bowlers, really. I don't think they're a huge issue. I don't think they're being given a chance by the batsmen. Now, the thing is that England have played 12 tests in Perth over the course of history, and they've won one of them, and that was pretty much against an Australian second eleven during the World Series years. They have lost the last six or seven, the last six, I think, go back to 1991. You, you, you can't honestly have an awful lot of confidence. So I am looking in the eyes of some of these England guys, and I, I'm, they, they're trying they're trying to believe, but it's just not there. I thought Alistair Cook looked a beaten man today. I've never thought that before. I've never thought that before. Um, I'd be flabbergasted if England haven't lost the Ashes by the end of the Perth Test, I'm afraid. Well, George, let's pick up on that, because I know that the series is yet to be decided, but you're talking about the fact that sort of mentally it almost has been. So what... Well, I thought the fielding was a reflection of that. Does that make sense? That does make sense, but I mean... Because so it very often is. Sorry. That's okay, but I mean, just as a consequence, I mean, what... I mean, are England already looking to salvage something from this tour? Is that how, how desperate they are at the moment? No, I mean, I don't think consciously that's the case. I think they are talking about winning. And uh, although they look shell-shocked, hopefully they'll wake up in the morning and they'll think, they have to think, that if they win here from this position, it will be the greatest achievement of their careers. And I think that's a, a sensible, positive way to look at it. And, you know, cricket wouldn't be the wonderfully enchanting, entertaining game it is if we could predict what was going to happen. That's one of the reasons we like sport, isn't it? It but, is. You would have to be, you know, if anyone thinks that England are, are going to win this series, I would like to be drinking some of what they're drinking. Well, especially considering that three years ago, um, Perth was the, the one ground where Mitchell Johnson came good, and um, he's flying at the moment, full of confidence. Um, and his rebirth with the Red Bull has been spectacular, Bryce. No doubt that he's also managed to get inside the heads of, of all of the England players. And um, I just personally can't see any way of England reversing that. I just wonder what you think. I mean, is there any way that England can get on top of Mitchell Johnson, Bryce? I, I think he's um, I think he's a player that you have to play with understanding he is going to bowl short spells. Um, I know in domestic cricket in Australia and, and the short form of the game, that it was a similar way to that the players played Sean Tate the real express bowlers were, were just bowling short spells. So you know there's 30 balls that he's got to bowl at you 
and you just need to survive. You need to deny, 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 and then get some hours into the other guys bowling. It's it's got to be a team mentality and a team approach to how to counteract him. I don't think it's a matter of can we get on top? Do we start fighting fire with fire and hooking the ball and doing all that? That is not going to work. That will cause trouble. That will fall right into the hands of the the Australian team and what they want to see. They want to see the cross bat shots, which is an uncomfortable environment, particularly at the Wacker. People think that the Gabba was foreign conditions, the Wacker, and that's why Australia and it's been a fortress there because they are, it is so fast and bouncy and it is back to its fast and bouncy best there. So they just need to deny, deny. Short ball won't get them out, duck underneath. I thought Monty played it probably the best. He just ducked down. As soon as he saw it was short, he got little and curled up in a ball and got out the way. And I think that's a simple way to do it um, because it's not a ball that should get you out unless you take it on. And I don't think it's the type of bowler or the type of tactic that England need to take up is we're going to take him on fire with fire. You just need to deny those type of players. George. Spot on. Spot on. That was absolutely spot on. And the thing is, you know, that none of England's 10 wickets in the second innings were to deliveries that would have hit the stumps. Even the one that did hit the stumps wouldn't have done unless Kevin Peterson had played it on. And the, the other thing just about um, Mitchell Johnson is that he's actually not really getting the top order out. He's getting Alistair Cook out, yeah? In both innings, he got Alistair Cook. But he didn't get anyone else in the top five, I don't think. But what happened is that they got themselves out. So Ian Bell in the second innings, he hit a full toss down mid-on's throat. Uh, Kevin Peterson in the first innings flicked off his hips to mid-wicket. Joe Root swept. A ridiculous shot, really. Uh, so actually, in many ways, they showed that they can deal with him. He's absolutely, he can be combated. Of course he can. Um, and, and it's the problem is that the top order are getting themselves out in other silly ways, partly because they're rattled, I accept, and that is exposing the lower order. Now the lower order can't play him, uh, and, and you know that's a bit of a concern. But you know it's not really James Anderson's job uh, to, to to score runs against Mitchell Johnson and Co. So yes, the 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 there is a bit of um, there is a bit of encouragement there for England. A bit of encouragement, but but not very well, much. A little bit. Well, I mean, the fact is they're going... Uh, Peter Siddle's bowling beautifully, and we haven't even mentioned him, and he is bowling fantastically well, and we know what a good bowler Ryan Harris is. And, you know, uh, uh, there's no let-up, because Watson hardly bowls a bad ball. The only bad ball he bowled in this match, Carberry managed to pull it uh, straight to mid-wicket and was out. So uh, it's, it's looking like a very strong side. But, you know, we know, we've seen enough cricket to know that if you grind it out... The bad ball will come. And actually, I think England's tactics in this game were poor. And, and this, this hooking and pulling was nonsense. They should play the classic English attritional game. And this is why they're missing, or part of the uh, fact is that they're missing trot. But they should grind it out. They shouldn't be afraid to defend. We don't see draws in test cricket, you know. We really don't. I keep saying this, don't I? Unless it rains, we hardly see any. So England should be unashamedly dull if that's what they think their best game is. But I, I thought today the way that they shirked their responsibility, playing these macho nonsense shots and getting caught on the boundary. I thought that was dreadful. Well, the, their approach has been naive. Uh, and yet, Bryce, that there have been signs. that I talked about the hunger at the, the top of the program and the passion that you, you elaborated on. And yet there were, there were signs at times, uh, for example, yesterday, when Ben Stokes and Matt Pryor were putting together their partnership, that Ryan Harris was he was on the edge and he was very close to to actually probably tipping over to the other side and, and so they're quite highly strung the Australians they want it so much that if England can manage to produce some attritional cricket then they could quite conceivably manage to turn things around. Yeah it was a, it was a very good partnership that so the signs are good at, I guess from an England perspective it's good to see Pryor make some runs he, he's had a horror series so far but he's found a way now um, and, and he is a, a positive cricketer and when he does those things, but then you look at his dismissal. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword, and it was very disappointing. George has already touched on that, of course. But I, I think that partnership showed that, you know, that, that once there was a bit of counter-punch and fight, um, you know, Australia had to work and they got a bit frazzled, and uh, that's when the loose balls will come. I, I thought Joe Root's innings was absolutely outstanding. Uh, England have found their number three for the next 10 years. There's no doubt about that. He was outstanding. And and given what was thrown at him, he just played it. And he's just got that little boyish smile of, 
it just doesn't bother me, boys. You can give it whatever you want. I'm just going to play the next ball. He keeps it simple. And maybe that's just a clear mind of a, uh, of a young cricketer learning his way, that he doesn't have the scars of years gone by. He, he, he is an absolute highlight, and uh, you know I'm sure that he'll perform many, many bigger innings. You know, it was a shame that he went out the way he did. It was a bit unfortunate, but I'm sure he'll play many big innings for England. Isn't something we should be picking up on Joe Root, though, Bryce, the fact that he comes from Jason Gillespie's Yorkshire and from the Darren Lehman Academy. This is what I heard it was being reported in Australia, that essentially Joe Root is pretty much Australian. So um, that's why we should be thanking you for, for this. Um, and actually, we, we don't produce any good cricketers of our own. Um, they all have to have some form of Australian influence. Let's turn our attention to the Wacker. Um, obviously, just a few days before this third test starts. Um, as far as England are concerned, George, many more questions to answer than, than Australia have at the moment. Should Tim Bresnan come straight back in? As far as the spin's concerned, should Monty Panesar get the nod ahead of Graham Swan? People think that's unlikely, and yet on, on the evidence of the bowling that we've just seen in Adelaide, Monty, I think, undoubtedly bowled better. Um, Do you and think? Then... I didn't think that. I didn't think that. I have to say, I didn't think that. I'd be interested to know what Bryce thinks about that. I thought Monty dropped quite short. I thought they, they went after Swan, and it came off. I don't think he's getting quite the same dip he did, which was so valuable for him, and I don't know why, and I worry about his elbow. But I didn't think Monty bowled particularly well. What did you think, Bryce? Uh, he, there was a, a dismissal he got of Steve Smith, and Steve Smith just played down the wrong street. It wasn't a special delivery, but he made it look amazing. He didn't move his yeah. feet. Uh, he, did a, he did a similar similar dismissal to Clark in the second innings, and you sort of go, well, hang on, what, what happened there? It was like the, the players just missed the whole... The, the whole shooting match. But, look, I think um, Swan is still the best spinner, and he's probably one of the world's best, to be honest. I, I really do like him. I think he, if he considers the way he bowled at the Gabba, now he bowled with a lot more side spin than Nathan Lyon. And in the game, on a bouncy conditions, on a strain conditions, you need to bowl with more overspin. Now, he'll enjoy, if he thinks about the flight of the ball at the, at the, um, at the whacker, where the Fremantle doctor will come in, he'll get a beautiful breeze to drop the ball and drift it and not worry so much about the side spin, what happens after the ball lands. That'll look after itself as the, the pitch goes on, but he'll, he'll generate more deception by looking... So unfortunate to be left on... That on the... overspin, get that... Is it, is it an easy thing to do that, though, Bryce? If... If Graham Swan is a spinner who pretty much goes for sideways spin, as you say, and, and the dip and the drift, of course, but is yeah. it easy to change to pretty much bowl over spin? Uh, at, at that level, George, yeah, the test cricketers need to have those those attributes of, of, of plan B, C and D for the, and bowl for the appropriate conditions. And I think he, he would have learned a valuable lesson from watching Nathan Lyon at the Gabba and where he was out bowled man for man. And I'm sure that he'll we'll see that. We'll see he'd have to bowl with more overspin. And that's the way you'll need to bowl in those conditions. And he'll enjoy them because the, the Fremantle doctor is perfect for a, a uh, an off spinner um, in, in Perth. Yeah, okay. I don't think they'll drop him. I don't think they'll drop him because he can catch as well. And Monty can't. And, you, you know, you start taking out your second slip uh, from a side that has just dropped a whole lot of catches. He can bat. I know he didn't look like he could in this game, but he can bat. I mean, you know, he's just set a world record, hasn't he, of being the uh, quickest to 250 test wickets as a finger spinner. You know, he got out there in the same amount of tests as Kirtley Ambrose. I think he did it in Brisbane. So, you know, let's, um, he's had a bad couple of games. But, you know, a lot of off spinners in Australia have. Yeah. Okay, but you've convinced me. Swan's going to get picked. Monty's going to get dropped. Um, well, then, uh, yeah, I think so. Monty will be dropped. They're going to play two spinners, are they, at Perth? Absolutely. So I don't know who comes in. I mean, I, I, you know, there's a case for bringing in one of the quicks. I know people in England are very keen that England plays Steve Finn. I would just say that anyone who saw him play in Alice Springs isn't saying that. Uh, he just he doesn't. You, you wouldn't recognise him as being the Steve Finn who bowled so well in international cricket a year or two ago. Boyd Rankin, I would be tempted by. But I think they'll probably just go with Bresnan because that's the English way. Uh, which means, again, you haven't really got any pace and I know people are getting frustrated that England don't have an answer to Johnson but that's okay play the England game play 
the hand you're dealt. And England got to number one with that attack. Yeah, they got to number one in the world with that attack. It's fine. You don't have to play the Australian way. You bowl light and length, you nibble it around a little bit. That's fine. That's what England are good at. So they'll probably go for Bresnan. And I think they might stick with Stokes at six as well. He, you know, he's, he's a boy who's learning his trade, a fellow who's learning his trade. Uh, so he is a bit raw. He's got a bit of pace. Um, so I, I, I think that's what they'll do. England aren't into big knee-jerk changes. And if people think they're about to call up, you know, Steve Davis or Joss Butler or uh, Ty Mole Mills, they've just not been watching what Andy Flower does over the last three years. No, definitely don't expect them to do anything over the top. I, I think some people were perhaps surprised by the amount of changes they made for the second test um, because it didn't seem like a very England reaction, but they were all relatively sensible changes, and I would also agree, I think Stokes has got something that's feisty about him, and I think they need that um, on this tour at the moment. As far as Australia are concerned, Bryce, any changes you can foresee them making for the Wacker? Do you think they'll stick with Nathan Lyon, or do you think they'll go in with four quicks? No, I think I think they'll, they'll play Nathan Lyon, and uh, he'll, he'll bowl well there, the extra bounce, which he showed at the Gabba, um, and, and he, he's bowling well at the moment. I, I don't think there'll be any changes. The only possible change will be around workload and how the guys are feeling. It, it's a, it's a three-day gap, and uh, it, it's going to be quite taxing. We, it, we're into the game on Friday, and so if if Harris is feeling a bit sore and a bit tender, well, they, they might change it. The big word is that Doug Bollinger's bowling as fast as ever and having two mean left armers, um, one with... Uh, I guess hair on his upper lip and one with someone else's hair on the top of his head. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, he could be that guy that comes in and, and, and continues that uh, that aggression. And, and he does swing the ball as well. So he's, he's got some good armoury and word is that he, he is back to his very best. And if that is the case, I, I would suspect he would be the change. You, well, you know, the thing is, JHB, they actually already have four fast bowlers because if you include Watson who's almost as fast as anyone in the England team, then, you know, why on earth would you need a fifth? So, and, and, I, and the Lion, you know, will get a bit of bounce in Perth. England haven't played him particularly well. He can pl provide the holding role if necessary. I'd be amazed if they changed their side, to be honest. And, and England, this is another thing, factor today, on the final day, England should have made them work for their wickets. They should have at least have tried to keep them out there and try to, to to make them weary going into the Perth Test. So I, I thought that today was, a, 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 again, a gormless performance. Yeah, I would say, that for Bryce, what you talk about, sort of soreness on, on the part of the Australian bowlers, they haven't really had to bowl for any length of time in this series so far. So I, I'd be hoping, from an Australian perspective, that they were all pretty well rested. Just on Nathan Lyon, before we conclude, um, very noticeable in the way that he was running in in this test match, that he seems to have lost a bit of his bounce. Just wondered if he, if you noticed anything with that. Just his his whole run up was very much more of a walk than a, a skip in, and and, and I just it, it seemed to be quite flat. Yeah, look, I I didn't notice it directly, but uh, it could be just a bit of fatigue maybe coming in on there. Um, what I did notice at times, so though, when there there was situations in the game where it, it could have been attacked. He tended to rush his way through. Um, he, he didn't consider what he was doing. He was around the wicket for a long time where there was plenty of big footmarks from, from Johnson over the wicket where he could have bowled and spun the ball back to the off stump, which would have been a very attacking line. He was very comfortable going around the wicket. Um, I, I guess he's still developing those type of things. He is taking wickets still, but... Um, and maybe he is getting a little flat, um, but he's such an energetic guy in the field. He, he gives 100% all the time. So I, I'd I'd be surprised if there was any change. But um, yeah, maybe just a, a bit of fatigue. He did bowl a number of overs in the test. Yeah, he did bowl a, a lot, and we expect to see him again back at the Wacker. And um, plenty of questions that will need to be answered from two very different uh, camps as far as mood is concerned. We'll be back in quite probably under a week, unfortunately, to analyse the aftermath of the third test at Perth, all this, the prophecies of doom and gloom. I'm being washed along with the... It's my youth. I'm just returned to my youth when Australia used to thrash England, and it's, it's a very uncomfortable place to be. It's horribly um, familiar, isn't it? It is horribly familiar. Uh, the question is, will Bryce be basking in the glory of the triumphant return of the Ashes to Australia, or will England have given themselves a lifeline? Well, join us next time to find out. Until then, though, 
Thank you very much to Bryce and to George, and thank you for joining us here on The Huddle on ESPNCrickInfo.com.